when Noah, our son, was a freshman in high school, he was in a D group, and his D group was looking for some place to serve. Amy hadn't left Brandon at Buddy Break yet because she didn't have someone that could stay with him. She was just sitting waiting for Timothy to be done. Sometimes Brandon would wait in the car while I brought Timothy in, and every once in a while Brandon would come in with me, but then he would shoot right back out the door again because of his anxiety. One week I was there dropping Timothy off, and Brandon just marches to the beat of his own drum and decided he was just gonna sit at one of those tables in the foyer. If Brandon decides he wants to sit, then that's what we do, we sit. <laughs> so as far as I'm concerned, I just have to wait him out. Carrie came along with her buddy, and both of them sat at the table and started talking with us. And we just sat there the whole entire time, talking, having an amazing time. I said, if he doesn't have someone to buddy with, then I would be willing to do that if you think that I can do it. It's a really nice thought, and it's super sweet, but she has no idea. But she was super persistent. She was like, nope, he's my buddy. Brandon and I were friends before Amy and I were friends. We tell her that all the time. Through Carrie, then we start meeting Chris and we meet Noah. For him, when he wants me, he goes like this. Noah, he wants you. It was February, and then I think by summer, we were spending time at their house, and I mean, honestly, we just show up. There's not a lot of planning. She only lives like 13 minutes from here, so it's not that difficult just to scoot over there. I graduated, went to a little bit of college, and I started getting into harder drugs. I've been to four or five treatment centers, and I spent four months in Salvation Army. Even through that, though, Brandon was there, Amy was there. Amy and Brandon came in and visited me. Even though he can't talk, he can't write. I used to get calls from Amy, and he would just scream and make noises, but you know, I could just hear the joy in his voice, just hearing my voice. He helped me get through a lot of that. Amy helped me get through a lot of that. Just to watch him struggle and try to fight against everything that he's had to go through has been hard to watch. And I don't think I've prayed more for any one person ever, just that Noah would see his value and that he would be able to see himself the way that the Lord sees him. Hopefully he saw that through each one of us, through me, through Brandon, Megan, Timothy, that he saw Christ's love shining through for him, too. In the hardest times, we had to tell Noah that there was something for him to live for. And what we told him that he had to live for was Brandon and Kids for Masterpiece Ministry, because that's what his gift is. Brandon needs Noah. Noah is one of the guys that can show up in difficult circumstances, get Brandon to do what Brandon needs to do. I enjoy every second I spend at that church with kids with disabilities. And I was thinking one night, like, what's my purpose? Like, why am I even staying clean and sober right now? You know, like, what am I doing to really benefit anyone? And the first thing that came to my head was the Clark boys and like the impact I've had on them and the impact they've had on me. My kids who are nonverbal, they're not able to read, they're never gonna be able to pick up the Bible and understand all the concepts that are in there. But what they do understand, what they can read, what they can see, what they can feel, is the love of Christ shining through each one of the Duffies. It's not something that I went to school for, it's not something that I have experience in. God just equips you for where he wants you to be. It didn't turn out to be just us serving them. I think we are all way better for knowing the Clarks. He served at Johnny and Friends. I do a program at my school now with special needs. Bethany volunteers at her high school with students with special needs. Noah works for Fox Valley Rep. And that's all because we met Brandon. Working with Brandon teaches you to be patient. <laughs> I think we are all more patient and loving with with everybody. Even you.
if you're, uh, if you're ever wondering what the church is, you just watched a picture of it. That's the church. You know, when, um, when Chris said of his son Noah, Brandon needs Noah, and Noah needs Brandon. That's what the church is. People serving each other out of love for Christ, and God demonstrating how much he loves us through that service. Here, Amy's heart saying, I just wanted him to know how God sees him, and maybe in the way that my boys love him, even though it's nonverbal, would tell him that. So beautiful. Let's pray. God, thank you for the way that you love us and serve us. We don't deserve it. Sometimes we resist it. That's who you are. Help us to be like you in the world. Now open our minds and hearts and speak to us through your word. We pray in your name. Amen. Well, for over 15 years, strangers from all over the world have been sending their secret confessions to a suburban address in Germantown, Maryland. Every Sunday, Frank Warren, the founder of Post Secret, reads these anonymous postcard confessions. He says he has seen and read just about everything you can imagine over the years. He's received wedding rings, engagement rings, all manner of things, and all manner of things written and sent to him by way of secret confession. But there's one secret Warren says that he sees almost every time he goes to his mailbox. Expressed in different ways, with different words, it's the same basic need or longing every time. He says it's the deep desire to find that one person you can tell all your secrets to. The search for someone we can be our whole and true self with, without fear. Warren's not a believer, but he's onto something. Started this ministry, or not ministry, this, this project called Post Secret, where people can send their, their anonymous postcards. He even developed an app for uh, con- secret confessions, which he closed down because he thought it was doing damage. Now there are dozens of confession apps. What's this about? Why would people ri- write out their deepest secrets to somebody they've never met or will never see and confess it? Why would you do that? What's going on there? I think he says it right. This longing in each of us that we may not name or not always be in touch with, but it's there nonetheless, deep down inside, to be known. Someone to know what's really going on. But we are terrified of that, aren't we? Because for someone to know, then they would know, you know? (laughs) Then they would know about us, and we fear that if they really knew, they wouldn't accept, they wouldn't love us. That would be our undoing, and so we hide the psalm we're going to look at today in our series called Songs of the Soul, we've been in this series, it's 10 weeks long, it's 150 psalms, we just chose 10, because the psalms give us, they give us vocabulary for our faith, a range of human emotion and expression to God. It's been the prayer book of God's people through the centuries, and so we're learning how to speak what's in our hearts to God and hear back from Him through the book of the psalms. We're going to look at the psalm today, Psalm 32, that deals with this question, what do you do with your secrets? What does a Christian do with the hidden parts of our minds and hearts and lives? That longing in each of us to be known. Well, let's read Psalm 32, and we'll try to make some sense of it as we go. Psalm 32, verse 1. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, and my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright heart. This psalm is one of six psalms called the penitential psalms, psalms uh, that are expressing confession and and desire for forgiveness to God. 
The most famous is the Psalm 51, Psalm of David. Some of you will know this psalm. David wrote this psalm. We write songs about it. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Restore a right spirit within me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, he says. This is the psalm he wrote in the wake of being uh, his sin with Bathsheba being exposed. If you don't know that story, you can go read it in the Old Testament. It's a little uh, more than PG. David was a man after God's own heart, but also a man of, who sinned greatly and needed forgiveness. And this Psalm 32 is also by David. In some of your Bibles, you'll see a heading there, Blessed are the forgiven. Um, some of your Bibles may not have a heading there. By the way, if, you don't, if you're new to reading the Bible, chapter and verse numbers and headings, that's all stuff added later to help us find it. This is a poem. This is a poem written by David, longing to be set free from his sin, to be forgiven. And I think that heading is, summarizes it well. Blessed are the forgiven and covered. Blessed are those who are forgiven and covered. That word covered, we'll come back to that. It's a beatitude on the forgiven. You know, in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has the beatitudes. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the peacemakers. The word blessed in Greek and in Hebrew means fortunate, happy, fulfilled. So fortunate are those whose transgression are forgiven, whose sin is covered. Verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Did you hear it? There it is. In whose spirit there is no deceit. Meaning you're not hiding anything anymore. No secrets. You've come out with whatever's going on inside. No deceit. No covering up. And you find yourself blessed. How does that happen? Two words that are synonyms here for uh, used sin or transgressions. The first word is the word for transgression. It's the Hebrew word pesha. It's the most commonly used word in the Old Testament for sin. It literally means willful rebellion. So it's not sins that you commit that you're like, oh, I didn't know any better, or I made a mistake, or I, 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 oh, I didn't mean to do that. It's, I know what I did, and I, I knew it when I was doing it, and I did it anyway. How many of you have ever done something that you knew was wrong before and during the time you were doing it? If your hand's not up, you're lying or not listening to me, Right? We, could all, we would like to believe that most of our transgressions are, you know, I didn't know any better, or I, you know, I was unintentional. But if we're honest with ourselves, we know, and we just don't care in the moment. We just do it anyway. Willful transgressions. The word sin in that same verse uh, is the word hata. It literally means to stray off the path. Sin is not a topic of serious confession in our culture today. It's not a word we use. If it's used, it's used like as a joke in commercials, you know, like at Valentine's, the, the chocolate is so decadent it's quote-unquote sinful. Or lingerie commercials or something, we call things sinful. It's kind of like a wink-wink and a nudge and we joke about it. Or, or if we talk about it this way, sin, real sin, people get very uncomfortable, nervous in our culture. Because... I mean, who are you and who am I to tell somebody else their decisions are right or wrong? I mean, that's their life, and they have to determine what's true and right for them, and I have no business telling them they're right or wrong. I certainly shouldn't call them sinful. That's judgmental. But, I mean, even the language we use, right? Sharing our secrets versus confessing our sin. One sounds like, yeah, I'd like to do that. I'm not so sure about that. But the Scripture is saying the blessed person The pathway to blessing is through confession, dealing with sin and calling it so. That's what the psalm was telling us. Proverbs 28, verse 13, I'm picking up on the same theme. The wisdom of Proverbs tells us this. Whoever conceals or covers his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Whoever conceals or covers will not prosper. Let's talk for a minute about the consequences of unconfessed sin. David is looking back in Psalm 32 at his life and saying, when I kept silent, when I hid, when I covered up, when I had unconfessed sin, he says, my bones wasted away. I was miserable, though I didn't even know it. Looking back, he sees how miserable he was. Have you ever looked back at a time in your life and thought, I was a wreck. I thought I was fine, but I didn't even know till now I have some freedom and some space and some healing. I see now how, how messed up I was. Did it ever happen to anybody? You don't know it in the moment. Then you look back and say, how did I live like that? That's what David's doing here. He's looking back saying, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Look at verses 3 and 4 again. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. From day and night, your, heavy, your hand was heavy upon me. 
What does he mean by your hand was heavy upon me? The hand of the Lord in the Old Testament, when you see the phrase the hand of the Lord, or God's hand, that's most of the time a reference to the sovereign control of God. So what does David mean when he says your hand, God's hand, the sovereign controlling hand of God was heavy on him when he had unconfessed sin? Most of us think that when we, have, when we sin, God removes his hand from us, right? Because he's, he's, he distances himself from us. Or he's angry and he's going to get us and punish us. Neither are true to what David is saying here. God is not removing himself from David. His hand is heavy on him. Nor is he trying to punish him because he's angry with him. What's, what's happening here? David's saying, God's sovereign control, he would not let me go. I was trying to hide. I was trying to cover up. I was trying to ignore and keep silent. I did not want to face it, but God would not let that happen. Why? Because he loves me. He loves me too much to leave me in that condition, to leave me in hiding. You, you've experienced this, right? This, you've got something you're trying to keep hidden, and it just seems like you can't. You can't. Even if people don't know, you feel like they do. You walk around with this background noise in your soul like people know. We've all got this going on, and I have it. You know, I've shared this before many times. And I, I often, when I read, and Story and I have talked about this, when you read a text and you think about preaching it to God's people and you pray, God, what do you want to say through me to your people, through, thi through this, your word? It's an amazing thing. And then, you know, I, I often battle this. I battle, if they, if they, you, knew what was going on in here and in here, you would not listen to me up here. You've got that, we've got that voice in your head about you're an imposter, you're a fake, you're a phony. If they knew, if she knew, if he knew, we've all got it. That's the heavy hand of the Lord upon you. Why? Not to crush you, to make you, to fill you full of shame, to bring you out of hiding so he can heal you. The heavy hand of God is for our healing. This is James 5.16, right? James says, and, and if you don't, James is the half-brother of Jesus, and he's written this very practical little book in the New Testament. And he says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be what? I know you normally don't say anything out loud. You just look at me till it's over. But you can say it, right? And, con and, and confess your sins to each other that you may be healed. He doesn't say forgiven. Does this strike you as interesting? Forgiveness is achieved at the cross. Jesus has accomplished your forgiveness. But you don't walk in that, live in that, experience the freedom and healing of that until you enter into it through confession. Confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other that you may be healed, set free, liberated. Know the forgiveness in a profoundly powerful way. Our experience of God's forgiveness requires our ongoing participation by confession. Now let me just have a little aside here and say something that's important to say. David is talking here about the consequence of unconfessed sin. And when he says, my bones wasted away, I think he's talking about physical consequences as well as spiritual and emotional consequences. I don't think it's just a metaphor. We know about this with like when people have stresses, right? Stress at work, PTSD, deeply traumatic events uh, or, or, or emotional distress can manifest itself physically. We know this, medically speaking, right? People can develop physical symptoms of emotional stress. Why would we think it'd be different for unconfessed sin? I think he's talking about that. The healing is not just internal. However, here's the aside. It's very important that we don't assume that because someone's suffering, it's because they sinned or not, and are hiding it. This is, we should never make that assumption. This is the mistake of Job's friends. You know the story of Job? Job's under incredible suffering, and his friends show up, and they say, tell the truth, Job. Obviously, you're hiding something. If you weren't, you wouldn't be suffering this way, so tell the truth, and God will set you free. And God rebukes his friends. His friends show up, and for the first week, they don't say a word. They just sit with Job, and they're at their best when they keep their mouths shut, which is a good lesson for most of us. If you've got a friend who's suffering, just show up and be with them. You don't have to say much. So he's not saying, and we should never say or assume, that someone is suffering directly because of unconfessed sin. However, I do think it's wise for us to look inside and say, if I'm not experiencing all the freedom and joy that God has for me, if I'm under stress and anxiety and pressure and fear, and if I'm suffering in some way, maybe I'm hiding. Maybe God is trying to draw me out. Maybe that's the heavy hand of God upon me for my healing. I think that's what David is saying about his own life. Let's talk then about the pathway of true confession. Remember, we're talking about the person who is truly blessed, 
who's happy, who's fulfilled, who's full of joy. It's very interesting that in verse 1, David said, the blessed person is the one whose sin is covered. And then in verse 3, he says, when I tried to cover it or keep silent, I was miserable. So you're blessed if your sin's covered, but if you try to cover it, you're going to be miserable. Well, how does that work? You need to be covered, and you know this deep down inside. We need covering, but we can't cover it. This is the human condition in a statement, isn't it? This is is what's going on with us. This goes back to Genesis 3. Some of you will know your Bible stories. Genesis chapter 3, everything goes back foundationally to Genesis 1, 2, and 3. In Genesis 3, Adam and Eve, they had two rules, right? Two rules. They broke one of them. And they, what do they do? What's their first reaction when they, break the, when they sin against God? Transgress, willfully disobey, transgress God's law. What, what happens? What do they do? Do they go, oh, God, we're so sorry. Please forgive us and restore us. Is that what they do? No. <laughs> what do they do? Hide. hide. And they hide in the bushes, and they do something to what? They sew fig leaves together. Why? To cover up. They cover themselves. This is always the result. We, it's in deep in us. We know we need to be covered. Now, in our culture right now, we have psychologists and therapists and cultural trends have told us that sin is, you know, it's, 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 we need to have positive self-esteem and look within and feel good about ourselves and find our own, our own worth inside. And so we, do, we deny sinfulness, but we still feel sinful. That's our condition right now. We don't believe in sin. We still feel like sinners. And so the the cultural answer is, stop feeling that way. Believe in yourself. Love yourself. The Bible is saying, actually, there's a different path. There's a different path to to true freedom, to blessedness. It's called confession. When we try to cover and hide, it leads to our misery. But we know we need to be covered. Look at verse 5. I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Our sin must be covered, but we cannot cover it. The covering of our sin is a good thing. Do you know in Genesis 3, verse 10, Adam and Eve, they they try to cover up with fig leaves, and they, they can't do it. Do you know what God does? He makes coverings for them of animal skins. That's a theme right through the Bible. We're trying to hide and cover up, and God is saying, I'm the only one who can cover you. You can't cover yourself. It's outside your job description. It'll never work. You'll be miserable. It'll be your undoing. It'll ruin you. But I can, and I have at the cross, and I will if you let me cover you. Uh, When we come to confess, the Hebrew word, when, when David says, I confess, my sins and my transgressions. The Hebrew word for confess is the word yada. It literally means to know. He's saying basically, you know, God. I'm acknowledging that you know. You know all things about me, so I'm going to acknowledge what's true about me. And when we go to the New Testament in James 5, 16, confess your sins, the Greek word for the same concept is a compound word, homo legeo. It means to say the same thing, to speak the same thing as. Uh, so literally to confess means to say the same thing about your sin as God says about it. We don't want to do this. We want to give extenuating circumstances. We want to explain it away. We want to say, you don't understand how my mother was. She loaded me down with guilt. I've got a lot of issues. You know what my life is like. You know how much pressure there is at work. You don't know what she's like or he's like. We want to irrationalize and talk about why it wasn't as bad as you think it was. The Bible says true confession is to say the same thing as God says about it. And it begins when we stop blame shifting and stop spinning and stop. You, you, our culture doesn't help us, Right? A sports hero, a cultural icon, a politician gets in trouble for something terrible. It's all over Twitter. Everybody sees it. And what do they first do? How often do they stand up and say, I'm a broken person, and I've been hiding, and I just want you to know the truth about me, and I need your prayers. Wouldn't that be awesome if someone did that? I've never seen it. Not on Twitter or Instagram or anywhere else. What do they do? It's not true. It's a conspiracy. They're out to get me. Right? And then eventually... The pressure's too great, too many people know too many things, and so they confess as much as they have to to sort of save face and keep the sponsorships or whatever. This is not biblical confession. Biblical confession is to say, God, you know, yada, and so I'm going to speak the same thing. I'm going to say it. I'm not going to cover any of it. I'm going to trust you with it. That's what we're called to do. 
It's God's job to cover our sin. It's our job to confess it. Paul in 1 Corinthians 4 is this place where he says to the Corinthians, he said, listen, I don't care, if, I care very little if you judge me or any human court judges me. I don't even judge myself, though my conscience is clear. I'm not innocent. Only God can judge me. What's he saying? He says, I don't care if you or a human court judges me. I care very little about that. I don't even judge myself. Even if my conscience is clear, it doesn't mean I'm innocent. In other words, here's what he's saying. You cannot trust the culture around you to tell you the truth about yourself. Because that's a moving target. It always changes. You cannot even trust your own conscience to tell you the truth about yourself. Because you and I have a profound ability to lie to ourselves, to deceive ourselves. People do terrible things and don't feel any remorse. People are relatively innocent and feel crushed with guilt. You can't trust your conscience. My kids used to watch Disney sing along songs when they were little, you know, this little tape and the bouncing ball, the Jiminy Cricket song. Remember that song, Give a Little Whistle? I know I'm dating myself here. Anybody know that song? Is it just me? He says, if you find temptation and you see you start to slide, just give a little whistle and always let your conscience be your guide. With apologies to Jiminy Cricket, no, don't. Trust who? Paul says, I don't care if the court judges me, I don't even judge myself. There's only one who can tell me the truth about me, and it's the Lord. And so to confess is to say what he says about it. To agree with him. He's the only one who will tell you the truth. All of it. It's a scary thing. True confession begins where blame shifting and spinning ends. Now, the best thing outside the Bible that I've ever read on the subject of confession uh, is from a book by a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer called Life Together. His chapter on the ministry of confession is profound. He talks about the breakthroughs that happen in confession. Breakthrough to certainty, breakthrough to the cross, breakthrough to true community. And he asks this question, which I've pondered and shared many times. Perhaps you've heard me share it before. He says, which is, when you've really screwed up, I mean, big time, not a little white lie or a fib or a, a minor mistake, but you've really done something you're ashamed of, which would you prefer? Choice A, go privately in your room and confess secretly to God and just deal with it that way. Choice B, sit in a circle of 10 or 12 human beings who know you and tell them the whole truth about what you did. How many of you would say, you know, given the choice, all things being equal, I will take choice A? We all would. Why? He says, why is it easier for us to go alone before a holy God who we just sinned against than to sit in a circle of fellow sinners who can remind us of God's love for us? Perhaps, Bonhoeffer says, it's because we're guilty of self-forgiveness. We're actually not coming to God. We're just trying to cover Not that you can't confess in private. Of course you can, and of course God hears. But something profound happens when you bring it into the light, when you tell someone else, which is why you don't want to, because you want to cover. This is the the whole point. Jesus, in John 20, um, after his resurrection, before his ascension, he appears to his disciples, and the the text says he breathes on them. I wonder, do you ever wonder what that was like? (sighs) Did Jesus have bad breath? What was that like? I bet not. I bet it smelled good. Anyway, like a wind in their face. And then he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. His next words are, if you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they have not forgiven. Well, on one level, it sounds obvious. If I don't forgive you, I haven't forgiven you. What's he saying? He says, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit and the supernatural ability not to forgive sins, only Jesus does that, but to remind each other of your forgiveness to hear a brother or sister's confession when they, when they unburden and uncover and to tell them that they're loved anyway, that they're forgiven by Christ at the cross. Something profound happens when we do that. That's what David's saying. When I kept silent and tried to hide, it, it, I was miserable. But when I finally brought it out, I began to be healed. Let me read to you what Bonhoeffer says about this. Those who remain alone with their sin are left utterly alone. It is possible that Christians may remain lonely in spite of their daily worship together, prayer together, and all their community service together. And the final breakthrough to community does not occur precisely because while they enjoy community with one another as pious believers, they do not enjoy community with one another as fellow sinners. The gospel of grace, which is so hard for the pious to comprehend, confronts us with the truth. It says to us, you are a sinner, a great unholy sinner. Now come as you are, as the sinner you are, to your Father who loves you. 
For God wants you as you are, not desiring anything from you. Not a sacrifice, a good deed, but rather desiring you, just you. Saying to you, my child, give me your heart. You cannot hide from God. Listen to this. The mask you wear in the presence of other people will get you nowhere in the presence of God. I'll say that again. The mask you wear in the presence of other people will get you nowhere in the presence of God. You do not have to go online to yourself and to other Christians as if you were without sin. He knows. He sees. And he freely forgives. Let's work through the rest of this text here real quick. In verse 6, he, uh, he says, Let everyone, therefore, who is godly, offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. In other words, if it really is this simple, I confess God forgives, then, then he says, come to God while he may be found, at a time we may, we may be found. When is that time? When is the time when he may be found? Three o'clock tomorrow afternoon, right here. Don't, don't, don't be late. <laughs> when is it? Right now! Now, this is all over the scriptures. Isaiah 55, seek the Lord while he may be found. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 5, now is the t- day of salvation. In 2 second, in second Peter chapter uh, 3, God is not, is not slow. He's patient with you, not desiring anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. In Hebrews chapter 9, it's appointed for a person once to die, and after that comes the judgment, meaning now matters. Now is the time to bring out your unconfessed sin. Now is the moment for you to stop keeping silent about it. Now is the moment for you to come before God and trust that he really is forgiving. Why would you hide and cover? Why would you live in misery when he's offering you something? For most of us, because we really don't believe that. We live in a world where people use our secrets against us. We see it all the time, right? Stuff comes out about someone's past and and they lose their job, they're, they're Twitter shamed and their life is over. God is not like that. You know, Isaiah 55 is this place, this text where we, everybody always quotes. A day is like a thousand years with the Lord and a thousand years is like a day, right? We, we can't know God. He's not like us. The Lord is not like you. Who can know the mind of the Lord? It's a mystery. Can't know. It's not what he's saying. Right before that, it says, come to the Lord, seek the Lord while he may, may be found, for your God will abundantly pardon, full of steadfast love. He's not like us. He doesn't hold things against us. He's not keeping a long record to get you later. He abundantly, freely pardons. That's how he's not like us. In verse 7, we read this. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me in trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Let me summarize verse 7 this way. Don't hide from God. Hide yourself in him. And there's all the difference in the world. Don't hide yourself from the Lord. Hide yourself in the Lord. How do you do that? By uncovering and letting him cover you by his grace. You can't hide from him anyway. We're all doing one or the the other. We're all hiding from him. We're hiding in him. Paul says, your life, if you're in Christ, is now hidden with Christ in God. In verses 8 and 9, real briefly, this is an interesting one. Maybe it sounds like a strange change of the subject. He says, I, God speaking through David, will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye, yada, upon you. He knows. He sees. Be not like a horse or mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. What's he talking about? Well, he's saying the horse needs external forces to go where he's supposed to go, to do what he's supposed to do. The mule doesn't come to you because he loves you. The mule comes to you because you're feeding him or because you've trained him to. Don't be like that. Come to your father who loves you. Safe. Don't have to be forced or coerced. Come right to him. I shared this over the summer. We talked about a similar subject. I saw on Facebook, I don't remember where, but one of the few things on Facebook that was worth repeating, it said, religion is, man, I screwed up. You know, I hope my, my, hope my dad doesn't get me. My dad's going to kill me. The gospel is, I really screwed up. I better call my dad. Isn't that great? That's the difference. I screwed up. Dad's going to kill me. Or I screwed up. I better call my dad. Which, where, which one are you? David is saying, I thought I had to hide. I thought I had to cover. I thought I couldn't be honest. And it destroyed my life. And then I confessed. 
And I found out something was true all along. He loves me. He loves me. This is the joy of true confession. Let me read to you from 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, one of the signature texts in the New Testament on confession and forgiveness. John writing here in verse 8, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and we're good at that, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him out a liar, and his word is not in us. If we confess, he is faithful and just to forgive. This is what David says. I confessed, you forgave. That's how it works. It's that simple. It's not 24 steps you have to do. It's not 10 things you have to say repeatedly. It's not, you don't have to go through these rituals. You confess, he forgives. That's how it works. It's so simple, we almost don't believe it. But the most profound things are. It's just one step. Do you notice in verse 9 of John, uh, 1 John 1, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and what? Say it. Just. That is so important for you to get. I know we're, we're all out of time here. He's faithful and just. When you come to God for forgiveness, you're not just saying, God, let me off the hook again. God, please turn a blind eye. God, pretend like it didn't happen. God, be nice to me. Be merciful to me. He is merciful and gracious. You're actually appealing to his justice. How? Because it would be unjust for God to punish you for sins that his son already died for. It's paid for. It's his justice on the cross. So when you come to God and confess, you're counting not just on his mercy and grace, he is merciful and gracious, you're counting on his justice. It's done. It's paid for. It is finished, Jesus said. That's how David can, by faith, and we can now as Christians, look at Psalm 32 and see these last couple of verses. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous. Shout for joy, you upright in heart. How can, how can David go from my bones wasted away to I shout for joy? The path of confession. Entering in again to the truth about who he is in Christ, before God. That's what we do when we come to Christ in confession. That's how it's possible. You see this phrase in verse 10? The steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Meaning, if you trust God enough to come to him and be honest about what you're, what you're, what's going on, tell your secrets. Not on an anonymous postcard, but before the Lord. Steadfast love surrounds you. That word, steadfast love, is one word in Hebrew. It's the word chesed. Say chesed. Say it again so the person in front of you feels something on the back of their neck. Ready? Chesed. This is such an important word. It's the covenant, faithful love of God. The love of God which reaches past, through, beyond your sin, to the deepest part of your soul, to redeem and forgive and restore you. And nothing can change it. You can't out -sin it. Do you know that? You cannot out -sin God's grace. Paul says so in Romans 5, where, grace, where sin abounds, grace superabounds. Now, I'm not asking you to go out and try, right? But you cannot sin so much that God goes, enough already. We're moving on. Can't happen. Chesed love. When you trust God enough to uncover, he covers you with his chesed love. You're covered. You know you need to be covered. But you can't cover yourself. There's only one who can. And his name is Jesus. We're going to sing a song of confession to close the service. A song written by Anton, uh, who, who leads worship at our Kesslinger campus. But we'll, we'll sing it and hear it sing and, and, and confess together as we close this service. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we've all got secrets from each other and from ourselves, but not from you. You know all things. You know us right to the bottom. You know what we're hiding. And you know how that's killing us. And you love us enough to put your heavy hand upon us. To draw us out. And there are some here right now who feel that heavy hand. Who are hiding. God, in your mercy, don't let them hide. Bring them into your presence. Uncover their sin that you may cover it in your son Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Mm -hmm.